Good afternoon, brethren. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 is where I'm going to be this afternoon if you want to turn there. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. This afternoon's message is that Jesus has given himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. You know, I find hardly anything more honoring than standing up and preaching about Christ Jesus because he gave himself for me. In fact, it is one of the most satisfying experiences in my life to preach Christ. It is only second to communing with Christ. And good preaching does both. It's fellowship, it's insight, it's satisfaction. And I'm thankful for that. I have with joy drawn water from the well of salvation, and I have found it to be very refreshing. So it gives me great confidence when I stand before you that it will also be refreshing to you as well. Galatians 1, chapter 4, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. This year's renewal is about what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. Because the truth be known, there is nothing you can do personally to change yourself. You cannot advance in the faith upon the basis of what you do. You can't. It's not possible. When we go back to the beginning of the work of salvation, when Jesus was dying on the cross, the entire world was in a state of weakness. God does not tie our change to what we did. He ties our change to what he did. The change in our text is that he has, in fact, delivered us from this present evil world. And what is that owing to? He died. Not you did. It's what Jesus has done that's made all the difference in the world, and thus this conference is about what he's done. I know this grates against much of what calls itself Christianity today. We are living in kind of a Galatian era. The Galatian church had this kind of difficulty. Paul had to write things like this to them. I marvel that you are so soon removed from the gospel of Christ unto another gospel. We have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. Period. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should obey not the gospel, the truth, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth forth, crucified. See, we preach Christ crucified. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Which was it? What made the difference? Did God give you the Holy Spirit because of what you did? Is that what you think? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? God forbid. Well, hey, we're living in an entire church generation of people that believe what they did made the difference. That's why they talk so much about what they are doing and so little about what Jesus is doing. You are changed by what Jesus has done and by beholding that. Yes. And by your fellowship with Christ Jesus. That's what changes you. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. From glory to glory. That's advancement. Amen. Brethren, if Jesus 
had to deliver you from sin from the beginning, rest assured you advanced the same way. You came into the kingdom with both your eyes on Christ and you advance with both your eyes on Christ Jesus. So here's the postulate of our text, and I'll get to this later on in the message. The only way for a person to be delivered from this present evil world is to die to it. And the only way you can die to it is by being joined to Christ Jesus. You cannot talk people out of the world. You cannot tell them how bad the world is and all that stuff and they're going to change. It's not going to happen. You can't give them a five-step plan of how to get out of the world and quit being worldly and quit talking about the world and quit acting like the world and quit listening to the world's music. It's not going to happen. At some point, a person has to be joined to Christ in his death or they are not going to get free from the entanglements of this world. That's what we want to see this afternoon. Now, let's just begin right out front just by saying this. This is the will of God that you be delivered from this world. This is according to the will of God. Hmm? This comes direct from the throne in heaven where all power is. This comes direct from the throne where all destinies are determined. Where God sits upon his throne and judges between the nations. And the mandate has come down from heaven. Love not the world. Amen. Neither the things that are in the world. Amen. This has come from God. It's the will of God that we be delivered from this present evil world. Now the futility of popularized Christianity is this. It does not produce people that have a conversation that distinguishes them from the world. That's what's so blasphemous about it. They can't quit talking about the world. They listen to the world's music. They dress like the world. They even entertain themselves with the world. Exact same way the world does. You don't see any distinctions. You try to talk to them about Christ and they can't get off the earth. This is a serious problem. Because this is the will of God that you be delivered from this present evil world. And if that isn't happening, the will of God is being frustrated, at least for the person. Now, we see this in John 17, that this is, in fact, the will of God. And what I want you to note about this, in John 17, Jesus is about to die. I am very interested in knowing the course of Jesus' mind, the emphasis and thrust of his mind when he's near death. Amen. John 17, 4 to 5. Jesus anticipates leaving the world. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I'm longing to be back in your presence. Well, so much for Jesus setting up a kingdom on the earth and reigning here. Jesus wanted to be there, not here. As soon as his work was done here, he was anticipating a home going. Amen. How can you possibly be joined to Christ and not have the same kind of anticipation? I would say that's impossible. I don't, I don't care who you are. In verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them me. Out of the world. Out, out of the world. And they have kept thy word. What does that mean? When they embraced Jesus' word, it made them an alien and a misfit in this world. 
And when God gave them to Jesus, they were free from the world. What a marvelous truth to see. You want to know when you got free from the world? Is when God gave you to Jesus. Thine, thy, you were in that same category. You were God's. He gave you to Jesus. When he did, the connection to the world was broke. Well, I love, I love the way Jesus thinks. I, this is absolutely marvelous. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Well, Jesus, look. I mean, I know this is obvious, but Brother Aaron has said in time past, there's glory in stating the obvious, so let's state it. Jesus is not of the world. Amen. He's not. If we've got a worldly Jesus, I shudder to even say that. But we do have another Jesus, don't we? We've got another Jesus being preached who hands out the hope of the world to the people. That is not the real Jesus. These people need to stand up and start saying this. Repeat after me, Jesus is not of the world. Now fit that into your idea of heaven. It's not of the world, brother. It's not. And then down in verse 16, he again says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. How about that for reconciliation? Huh? The one saved and the one who's saving, neither one are of the world. That's a marvelous picture of reconciliation. We can say just like Jesus, when the world goes, a good riddance. We're glad to see Jesus folded up like a vesture and just discarded like a garment. We're looking forward to that time. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now notice Jesus is anticipating home going. Where I am is in this world. Basically what Jesus is saying is you can't fit the glory that God has given me from the foundation of the world into this world's structure. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. That's right. And you can't shove the gospel into an earthly agenda. It won't fit. You're going to have to be cutting parts off just like they do. It's there when we're going to see his glory. And he's anticipating the time when that happens. What is that? That's the consummation of the work of salvation. He's going to make all things new. And at that time, God will be their God, and they will be his people. And he will, they will follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. You know why? Because they learned in salvation to do it here. If you learn to follow Jesus here you will most assuredly be following him there. Amen. If you don't, well, it's not looking good. So this is the will of God, brethren. And as Jesus approaches his death, the time when he makes the break for his people from the world, he's anticipating them being delivered from this present evil world. Well, this is the will of God, brethren. This is the will of God. Now let's look at the necessity of deliverance here for just a few minutes. You know, there are two neglected considerations as I see it. I understand that my experience has been limited, so I speak with that in mind. But in my experience, it seems to me we're living in an era where two things are being neglected as a form of discussion in the pulpit, and one is sin and the other is righteousness. Those two concepts. Hmm. You know, in the scripture, sin is mentioned 389 times, and I, I just took this just, just bare sin form. I'm thankful for what Brother Vic said last night, because he gave me more ammo there. Let's just variate that by 10. You're talking thousands of times God mentions sin. In all of its varied forms, transgression, sin, disobedience. Righteousness is mentioned 289 times and a whole lot more 
when you consider the word just, justice, righteousness, and all the, all the different, right, just right was mentioned like 500 times. It was astounding. <clears throat> These two concepts that I'm, I'm convinced are being obviated by the contemporary Christian viewpoint. Salvation. They're being pushed out, being pushed out, and replaced by other things. Distinguishing marks that God made in the scriptures are being lost, like sinner and saint. Songs like sinners are only, saints are only sinners saved by grace. Is that really so? Then what is the distinguishing mark? Huh? What does it mean to be saved? If we're not saved from sin, then what are we saved from? Words like righteous, the righteous, and the unrighteous. Right, you're losing, those, you're losing those, those distinguishments, being left off. Huh? They're being left off. It's a very perilous time in which we live. These themes, sin and righteousness, are constantly mentioned throughout the scriptures. And I just want to give you a few examples here. Of Jesus, it said, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. He hath made him to be sin for you who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And on and on we could go. But here's the point. The contemporary Christian church age that we're living in is losing the concept of a God that has a righteous standard that he demands. Now, I understand that this, is, this, this can sound like a real hobby horse. We talk about these things a lot in our fellowship. But I'm telling you, people are going to go to hell because they don't understand these things. Of sin and righteousness. Psychological terms like unconditional love are replacing them. So what is the bottom line of that? Well, the bottom line of that is we've got an unrighteous God on our hands. That's the bottom line. Who loves Demas no less than he loves Paul. Well, he loved Cain straight to hell. You've never heard people say things like this? This is stupidity. What is his love then? Love Cain no less than he loved Abel. Unconditional love. This is, this is a terrible thing. So now we're making appeals to people that aren't converted, already telling them God loves them. So that there is no real heartfelt conviction about sin. They don't understand the value of forgiveness. The fact that sin is running rampant in the church is telling you they don't understand the seriousness of sin. In some measure. Don't understand that. See, this is a serious thing. Serious, serious thing. People are coming to, cross, to Christ because, well, they're not really coming to Christ, but they're coming to what they call salvation because they believe God already does love them. Say, well, shouldn't we tell them God loves them? It holds out hope. No, you come to Christ because you need salvation from sin. Amen. Before we ever tell the people God loves them, we tell them God's righteous. Amen. The most critical matter in salvation is not meeting your need. It's God maintaining a righteous standard while saving the ungodly. Amen. Now, what I'm telling you, here's the bottom line of what I'm telling you. It is in the context of our understanding that we are slaves to sin and cannot extricate ourselves from it. And on the other side, recognizing that God is so holy and righteous that he can't wink at sin. 
When you come upon that rock and hard place, Jesus looks pretty good now, doesn't he? Yeah. But if you don't understand these two things, Jesus' ministry of taking sin away has absolutely no significance at all. You wonder why he's going to the background and men's desires is coming to the foreground? It's because people don't understand sin and they don't understand righteousness. You see, brethren, my message is he died for our sins that he might deliver us from what kind of world? A good world? Pretty good world? Righteous world? Is that what kind of world we're in? This present evil world. Amen. Evil. Evil world. Now let us understand right away and I know you understand this, but I'm going to underline it again. That God is a righteous God. And he will not countenance sin without destroying it. Oh, forbearance, forbearance is in place, but forbearance has a time limit. My spirit will not always strive with man. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. This is what puzzled the prophet. These people are sinning right in your face, Lord. And it puzzled him because he knew how God was. That if God ever looked on sin, God is going to do something about it. It doesn't matter if it's the entire world in Noah's day. It's coming down. It doesn't matter if it's in one city or in a few other cities in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to burn them up. It doesn't matter if it's in one person who professes faith in Christ Jesus. When they lie, they die. When Uzzah puts his hand to the ark, he is immediately killed. This is our God. Seeing that we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace whereby we may serve God with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now I know in a lot of places you can't seem to get those two things together. Grace and fear. Because they assume that grace has taken fear away. No, we need fear. Well, you know what that means. Well, fear is just reverence. Okay, then so what he said was that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly reverence. Is that what he said? Fear. I understand not a fear that drive, would drive you from God, but it's still based on the same principle. God is a righteous God, and he will not wink at sin. When you're in Christ and you know that, you flee to him for refuge. Amen. Oh, let's not obviate fear. That's all part of the process. Hey, we're thankful for his grace, but we're not going to obviate or we're not going to take away fear. That's part of it. Moses drew near to God on Mount Sinai. This is a man that spoke to God mouth to mouth, and he feared. Hmm? Fear. Don't forget, he was also the one that said, show me your glory. We have both. God cannot countenance sin, and here's the divine determination from heaven this world is evil, and it's coming down. The only way that people can be delivered from wrath is to be delivered from the focal point of his wrath, which is the world itself. They've got to be unhooked from the world, or they're going to go down with it. That's the truth. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. The world and the lusts thereof are passing away. Amen. They're passing away. So he says, don't love it. Don't love it. The earth is, in fact, going to be removed. So, brethren, what we need is to be extricated 
from this evil, corrupt world. How's that going to happen? He gave himself. He gave himself for our sins. I, I love this appeal. I'm going to look at this from a couple different viewpoints, but I want you to, to note one thing. Note what he didn't say. We're talking about technicalities with the truth. Note what he didn't say. He did not say he died. Although he did die. That's instrumental. I'm not saying that's not instrumental. I'm saying look at how the prophet, how the apostle Paul is speaking to a church that's caught up in legalism. He gave himself. Notice the personal nature of it. He gave himself. You that are now turning away from Christ to a gospel that essentially causes you to glory in the work of your own hands rather than the work of his hands. That's basically what legalism is. Huh? Remember when the Pharisee was praying with himself? I fasted. He's telling God what he did. These are those filthy rags that, that Brother Tim was talking about. Say, Lord, here's another filthy rag. I'll throw you another one. Here's another one. Let me throw you another filthy rag. He's consumed in himself. That's what legalism is all about. You're just consumed in yourself. Got to be free from that. So he says, you that have forgotten, understand this, that you are ignoring the only one who could take your sin away and the one that freely gave himself to do so. That's who you're ignoring. He gave himself. I love this. You know, Christianity is like, if, I can, if you don't mind me using that term, walking by faith. We'll say it that way. It's a religion of the heart. It is. Religion is just the outward, outward working of your faith. That's all that is. See, what we do is a response to what we have seen by faith in our heart. It is with the heart that man believeth unto righteousness. It is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. It starts in his heart. Believes in his heart. Hmm? That's where your faith is. Your faith isn't in your head, it's in your heart. And your heart isn't your emotions. I know some people, when they hear the term heart, they immediately think emotions. No, that's not what I'm saying, because emotions can go up and down. It's not like that. It's in your heart. It's in the deepest part of your person, in the inner man. Where you can say things like, this one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. You can say things like that. You do things like this. The kingdom of heaven is like to a man that found treasure hidden in a field, to which when he found sold all that he had, and for joy thereof, he just sold it all. He said, this is so terrible, I have to give this up. He said, no, good riddance, I want the treasure. What is that? Amen. Saw something in his heart. In fact, Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they would be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. See, that's like the engine that gets us going. It controls the hands, it controls the feet, it controls the mouth, it controls the mind, the heart. Well, if you can ever get Jesus in the heart of men, remember Paul saying to the Galatians, talking about Jesus being formed in them, this is what he's talking about. Because if it can ever get there, it'll get here, and it'll get in their feet, and it'll get in their mouth, if it can get there. Amen. He gave himself. He's appealing to the heart of the, of the people. <clears throat> when you serve God upon the basis of rules, the heart becomes inactive. Yeah. They don't, legalistic, they don't even talk about desire. They don't even talk about this kind of thing. They serve God on the basis of duty. They draw near with their mouth, and their heart is afar off. That's the way it works. So he's seeking to break through to their heart again. You Galatians, this Jesus who is the king of glory, left his place in glory. 
to come down when you were in a state of weakness and ungodliness, and he wasn't. And he died for you. He gave, he gave himself. He gave himself. You might say it this way. Every single liberty you enjoy in Christ was bought by blood and suffering. Every single one. See, he gave himself. Scripture says he gave himself an offering to be testified in due time. See, he gave himself in suffering. The apostles made sure that the brother knew these things and would bring this up continually before them. Peter would say, you were not redeemed with silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition, but by the precious blood of Christ. He gave himself. He gave himself. You might say it this way, though he was free, he bound himself in order to loose those who could not free themselves. Yes, amen. See? He was free. See, he gave himself. He wasn't bound. He freely gave himself. Didn't he mention this? Didn't he say this? No man takes my life. I lay it down of my own cord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. Which means he freely gave himself. He wanted to do this. For a people that were bound... You know, when I think about this truth, I'm reminded, and, and uh, I looked at this today. You know, there was a provision under the law made for people that indentured themselves to somebody because they needed to pay debts or whatever. And uh, there was instructions given about that. And I just want to read them to you in Exodus 21. 2 through 6 says, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve. And in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door and under the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. So if he becomes a servant in a house, he brings a wife in. She goes out with him free. But if he comes into the house, the master gives him a wife. And then he has children by that wife. They become the masters. Unless... Because of his love for his wife and his children, he doesn't want to go free. He gave himself. You see, Jesus did not want to go free. In fact, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Why? Because he loved his master, and he loved his wife, and he loved his children. So what did he do? Give some silver and gold? He had to feel the cost to deliver them. He gave himself. He gave himself. He suffered. Suffered. Peter said it this way. He bore our sins in his body, on the tree. Bore them. He gave himself. See, it was a personal sacrifice that was required. That's what we see in the gospel. It was a personal sacrifice. He gave himself. So he's appealing to the Galatians. He personally died to give you the freedom to believe in God upon the basis of faith in Christ Jesus, and now you're turning to circumcision. Why are you doing this? So foolish. It's a very personal appeal, but I'll tell you this. If you can stand at the foot of Calvary and see clearly 
Christ offering himself freely because of our sin, you will not turn to the law as a means of trust. In fact, truth be known, you will not turn to anything else if you can see that clearly. Thank God for the gospel, for the continual reminders of his death. You know, at the Lord's table, we find we can actually shore up our resolve in this area. Because the devil is always seeking to displace the trust of the people of God. Uh, turn him to this. Well, if I can pray more, I'll advance more. Well, maybe if I fast, you know, that's the secret to perfecting holiness and the fear of God. If I can fast more. Or maybe if I read an extra chapter in the Bible a day, I'll... Oh, you, oh, the, the serpent is quite subtle. I've been a Galatian before. I know what this is like, and I'll tell you what. When my trust was displaced from Christ to other things, religious things, seeking to perfect holiness in the fear of God. But the trust was slightly turned to something else. God said, you're not making another millimeter of progress until you honor my son again. You wonder why people don't grow? It's because of this another gospel. They're trusting in something other than by the faith of Christ Jesus. Amen. And the primary work of salvation is to bring honor and glory to God through the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And when you trust in something else, you do disservice to the cross of Christ Jesus. Uh, he did not die in vain. You Amen. had to have this. Amen. And when you trust him, you glorify him. Yeah. And you glorify God. Amen. Now, I just want to, this last point and I'll be done. Uh, that's just marvelous to think. You'll find that the people that have advanced the most in the faith are the ones that know the most that their advancement is by the grace of God not by the work of their own hands. Oh, to a person, you'll find this is the way. The greatest people that have made advancements in the faith are people that trusted in God. They did not rely and trust upon their own works. They didn't do this. Now, let's look for just a moment at the experience of deliverance here. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now, your deliverance from the world is no less real than his suffering in sin. People talk too theoretically about being delivered from the world. All the while, they're still trapped in the world, and they can't get out of sin. People too often want to talk theoretically. We're not going to do that. The deliverance is just as real as the suffering and the sin. Was sin really put on Jesus? Well, then it's really put away in those that are in him. Huh? It's the way it is. It's so important that we see this. Now let's get back to this. The only way to be delivered from the world is to die to it. Hmm? You may have a burden on your heart for somebody right now that you know you feel they're like ties to the world and you're concerned about them. The only way they're going to get separate from that is by beholding and seeing Christ Jesus. They've got to see him. And they've got to see his death and what is done. That's how we get free, brethren. You have to die to the world. The only way to be delivered from the world is to die to it. Now let's look at what death is. Death is separation. That's what it is. Separation. You know, when uh, Rachel was given birth to Benjamin, you may recall, the there were complications in her pregnancy and she was dying. And the word of God says, while her spirit was in departing, right? Death is separation. It's separation. The scripture says of Jesus when he died, he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he gave up the ghost. His spirit separated from his body. Because death is separation. Now, with all men except for Jesus, death is a defeat. But with Jesus, death is an accomplishment. 
there's more in Jesus' death than him separating from his spirit. Now, Peter again says this. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. But here's the great thing to see. As soon as he died, bearing sin was over. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. As soon as he separated from that body, it was over. Sins had been thoroughly paid for. Why is that so significant? Because, brethren, when God puts you in Christ Jesus, the point at which your spirit contacts with his spirit, you know, we're joined to the Lord, the scripture says. You died with the likeness of his death. The scripture says of his death that he died unto sin once. That means it was effectively put away. And now he lives unto God. When you were joined to Christ, you died to sin. It was effectively put away. That's when you were delivered. See? You see, sin is a thing that ties people to the world. That's what ties them to the world is sin. When sins are put away, they're free from it. It's a marvelous thing. And I'll tell you, this isn't just a one-time act, but I like the hymn writer that says it this way. The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Why is that so? Because when you're with Christ, you're dead to sin. <laughs> it's a marvelous thing. When you're joined to him, you're, there isn't any such thing as a person that's in Jesus that's not dead to sin. This can't possibly be. It can't be. You're joined to him, you're dead to sin. And when you're free from sin, you're cut from the, from the desires of the world, the lusts of it. Amen. See? They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. It's a marvelous truth. I... I you know, I wish I had more time to say this. This is a marvelous truth to see. But this is why it's so critical to look unto Jesus, to stay, to not walk away from where God put you when he saved you. He put you in Christ, and at that point, you became separate Amen. from sin and from the world. You know, Amen. some would think, well, here's the best way of doing this. Let's just get him out of the world immediately. Well, God demonstrated that one time. He got Israel out of Egypt, but he never did get Egypt out of Israel. Here they were in the wilderness, and what are they talking about? Egypt. So what does he do? Here's the God of wisdom. He leaves the people in the world, and then he kicks the world out of their heart. Amen. So that they don't really want it. Brethren, we're not just talking about not wanting the world, brethren. When you're in Christ and you're dead to sin, you're not apt to be attracted to a world that is sinful. Hmm? It grates against your character, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you, we've joined a great hall of faith, and I'll just close with this. We've joined a great hall of faith. You're not the first ones, brethren, to be delivered from the world in your heart. Everybody who's walked by the faith, they all have been. Hmm? Right. Scripture says very clearly, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers, pilgrims on the earth. They weren't ashamed at all to say, me and the world, we do not get along whatsoever, and I couldn't be happier about that. Huh? It doesn't love me? I don't expect it to. Beware when all men speak well of you. Something's wrong. Amen. But see, that's not the greatest thing. God's got something to say about a people that have cut ties with the world. You know, he says in the in the closing section of my text, this is all according to the will of God. Now listen, brethren, in the end, the only will 
that is not going to be frustrated is the will of God. You being delivered from the world is part of his agenda. He's the alpha and he is the omega as well. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the one that put you in Christ and when he did, the tide of the world was cut. Not that we don't face temptations in the flesh, but it's not in the heart. And we would to God we never did face such kind of temptations. But he's going to finish this. He that had begun a good work in you, well, that's a good work, getting cut from the world. We'll perform it till the day of Christ. And here's what God has to say about that, about a people like that. He is not ashamed to be called their God. The world may cast you out, but God won't, so who cares? If God's really for you, do you think in the day of judgment, when you stand before the judgment bar of Christ Jesus, it's really going to matter to you that the world rejected you? Hey, brother, they're going to be worrying about their own state. You're going to be glad that you were delivered from the world in that day. Because he has prepared for you a city. So thank God for the work of salvation. God's not done yet, brethren. He's not going to leave you in the world. But pretty soon, Jesus is going to be coming back. So here's the way to continue to maintain your sanctification. It's by the faith of Christ Jesus. Look unto him and live.